right, Agape City, how are we doing on a Sunday morning? All right, we have work to do today. All right. If you're new here, I always start by introducing myself. My name is Brad. I'm the lead pastor of the church here. Uh, but today we are wrapping up a series uh, that we've called Pyramid Dreams. And, uh, and we've been looking at the life of Joseph. And we've been, you know, pulling out some principles. And a lot of these principles kind of apply to, like, the financial realm. They can or whatever, like saving and living within your means and being content. But uh, today we're going to wrap up the life of Joseph. And I have to go from Genesis chapter 41 all the way through chapter 50. So I got to cover these nine chapters uh, today. So it's going to be a lot. But I, I, I want you to know these words from Scripture. Because what we're going to cover today, I'm telling you, it is so important to all of us. So if you have a Bible with you, a Bible app on your phone, please open it up to Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41. While you're getting there, allow me to set the scene for you. Um, Genesis chapter 41. So two weeks ago, I had a lunch with a friend who's also a church planter, and we were sitting there eating lunch, and he brought up this concept to me that I've never heard before, and it was very interesting. Uh, he said, you know, we're just kind of like talking about, you know, starting churches and, and, and how we've been growing over the years and, and this kind of stuff. And what he said was this. He says, Brad, everybody tells the story of their life. Everybody tells the story of their life, and they put themselves in the story they're telling. And when they do that, they usually will play one of three roles. So everybody tells the story of their life. They put themselves in the story and as one of three roles. You're either the hero of your own story, you're the villain in your own story, or you're the victim in your own story. And that's what people tend to do. They'll, they'll, they'll re retell a story and they'll paint themselves as the hero, the victim, or the villain. And I was kind of thinking about that. I was like, I do that. Like, when I get home from, from, you know, work or I get home from being out, maybe I'm telling my wife about my day, and, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, and then this thing's happened. And then, like, the way I paint myself in that scenario, it's usually a hero, a victim, or a villain. And, and we all tend to do that. And, and here's what I want us to have eyes to see is um, if that is a tendency, most of us prefer to be the hero. But the truth is we need to be honest on the times where we're the villain. And what I'm seeing in the year 2024, for some reason, the name tag that a lot of people like to put on is victim. And what I want to encourage you to do today, as we look at this historical account that took place, and we see this, the, the, the strength, the wisdom, the beauty, the love, everything that happens pours off this page in our Holy Scripture, I want you to look at yourself with sober judgment and ask yourself, in this area of life, am I a hero, a victim, or a villain? And I want us to live out that identity well. That's going to make sense as the sermon goes on. But here we go. Genesis chapter 41 is where we're going to pick up. We're going to get towards the end of the chapter, verse 41. Genesis 41, 41. So we've been talking about Joseph uh, throughout this whole month. Joseph is uh, the son of a man named Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. The 12 sons, eventually, they make up the 12 tribes of Israel. So the whole nation of Israel started as a family. And Jacob has these 12 boys, and he has this one boy, Joseph, who is just kind of ordained by God. He has an ability to interpret dreams. Um, he's always been Jacob's kind of favorite son, and his brothers hated him for it. And so they threw him. They first were going to kill him. They decided not to. They just sold him into slavery to be nice. And then we read how he went to Potiphar's house, but he was faithful there. We read how he was put in the prison, but he was faithful there. And here we are at the end of Genesis chapter 41. J uh, Joseph is now brought out of prison because Pharaoh himself is having these nightmares, and he can't interpret them. So they bring Joseph to interpret these dreams, and Joseph tells him, hey, a famine is coming, and you need to be ready for it. And Pharaoh's like, you are awesome. And so because Joseph was able to interpret the dream, this is what happens. Verse 41, it goes on, it says this. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, this is the Pharaoh, the most powerful man on earth. I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring and he put it on his finger and he put it on Joseph's, and he put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him with robes of fine linen and he put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot uh, as the second in command and the people shouted before him, make way. Thus he, he put in, uh, him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. What a, what a, just a, a culmination of Joseph's life. 
I mean, he went from prison to get the signet ring. He gets a gold chain, and Joseph gets some riz on him. You know what I'm saying? Did I use that right, kids? No, nope, I don't know. All right. My daughter's like, Dad, stop saying words. I'm like, yeah, right, bro. No cap. No. <laughs> I'm so old. I'm so old. I remember in school one time I had a teacher freak out because someone called him dude. He's like, I am not a dude. I am of authority. And I was like in high school at the time. I'm like, calm down, dude. Uh, but now I have like students call me bruh. And I'm like, oh, I'm not a bruh. Okay, anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. So here's the scene. Joseph... Uh, he is put to the right hand of Pharaoh. He, 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 is, he is at the right hand of Pharaoh. He gets, he gets ordained. He gets, he, gets, he gets put like all the gold, whatever. And he now is in charge of everything. And, and so here's what I want you to notice by this. Notice Joseph's heart all the way through this whole account. Wherever he is, he just wants to honor God. When he's at his home and he has the ability to interpret a dream, he just wants to honor God. When he's in slavery at Potiphar's house, he just wants to honor God. When he's in a prison, he just wants to honor God. And when he's sitting with Pharaoh, he just wants to honor God. And notice, everywhere Joseph goes, he goes to the top of that organization. He's a slave in the house of Potiphar, but he's like in charge of all the other slaves. He's a prisoner in the jail, but he's in charge of all the other prisoners. You know, like wherever, when he goes to Pharaoh, he put one, only one role beneath Pharaoh. Wherever Joseph goes, he rises to the top. Why? You see, we live in a day and age where so many people, they, they think the favor of God has to do with wealth. And, and, and that's because we live in America and we, we turn everything into money in America. But, but, but understand, it's not about Joseph getting wealth. It's about wherever he was, he honored God. And so God took care of him. Didn't always make him wealthy, but he always treated him well, if that makes sense. Joseph was still in slavery, but, but God put him in, a, in the best of the slavery environment. He was still in prison, but he was the best of that in prison environment. You know, when he was at Pharaoh, he was put in the best of that environment. Joseph's healthy mindset and heart allowed God to kind of escalate him to the top of whatever scenario he was in. Now, he was still in some bad scenarios, but he made those bad scenarios the best they could be because he honored God. I wonder how it would change our life if we believed that was true. I don't like my job. I don't like going to this place. I don't like this scenario or that scenario. I don't like the amount of money I make or whatever it is. But, but wherever you are, could you honor God to the best of your ability there? Because maybe God will make that the best of it. it could be in that environment. And maybe that's the pathway then to jump to an even better environment. Let me give you a scripture real quick. It's in the book of James. James chapter 4, verse 17. One of my favorite scriptures on this. It's so easy and portable. It says this. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. If anyone just knows the good you ought to do and you choose to not do it, that's sin. Like a lot of times at churches, we, we, we say sin is like, you know, doing drugs or smoking or using a four-letter word or, you know, drinking, you know, three beers, two's okay, but three, that's a sin, you know, like... We, we, we say, we point sins are like these like things, right? Of uh, bad things to do, like these are, these are sins. But notice this, it's not just bad things. If you know there's a good thing you ought to do, like, oh, I should help that person. I should give that person a compliment. I should, I should tell that person what they mean to me. I should forgive that person. If you know something good that you ought to do and you go, yeah, but nah, and you don't do it, that is sin for you. And, and so... What that means is in every scenario we are, if we just do the next right thing, you don't have to do everything perfect, just do the next thing right. And if you do the next thing right, then, then God can honor that and he can use that. And if you do the next thing right, he can honor that and he can use that. And if you do the next thing right, and then all of a sudden you get this momentum where God's like, this is a real one. This one, like, this one will do what I say. This one, will, you know, he will forgive and she will, she will she'll, 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 she'll love. And, and like, 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 then God's like, I will give them more, I will give them more, I will give them more. So Agape City, that's my, my first question for you is where you are, your household, your neighborhood, your, your apartment complex, your, your, the place where you work, how, the, the commute that you go to your job, like the people who are around you in your life, what is the good that you ought to do? And are you willing to do it? When Joseph was in slavery, he was willing to do the good. When he was in prison, he was willing to do the good. When he's in the right hand of Pharaoh, he was willing to do the good. That's why God could use him everywhere. And it wasn't about being wealthy. It was about being well used for the kingdom of God. That's why Joseph was a blessing everywhere he went, because God used that heart. 
And I believe you and I need to have that similar type of heart when we want to honor God. So we have to do the next right thing. And so Joseph is at the right hand of Pharaoh. Everything's working out for him. The famine hits like this, like he said it would. Uh, it's been five years of plenty. They store it up. It's been two years into the famine. It's a five-year famine. They're two years into it. And all the regions around Egypt are starting to panic. They're, they're, they're running out of food, and especially Joseph's family back home in Canaan, they're running out of food, and they're going to starve. So Joseph's father, Jacob, sends, sends his sons back to get food out of Egypt. And so we go to chapter 42. Chapter 42, the first two verses says this. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Look at this next line. Then 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. Now this is, this is significant, more significant than you might guess this on a, a cursory reading. Um, so the, the brothers used to be 12. There's only 10 now, uh, there's 11 now, but jo- Benjamin stays back and only 10 go to Egypt. This is key because uh, what you need to know is this. Jacob had two wives. He had Leah and Rachel. He also had children with Leah's servant and Rachel's servants. So he has four, he has to, all the 12 children are from four different women, but there's only one woman who Jacob loved. And the woman that Jacob loved was Rachel. And Rachel only gave Jacob two sons. Joseph, who Jacob believes is dead at this moment, and Benjamin, who is Joseph's biological, uh, full biological younger brother. And notice, Jacob is still doing the same thing he did at the very beginning of this account. He has a favorite. His favorite children are Rachel's children. He loves them more than Reuben, more than Simeon, more than Levi. He lo- and he makes it known that they're special. The way he treats them, the way he gives them gifts. He's not a good parent. And notice at this point, he's not changed. Jacob is still making the same generational sin. Because think about what he went through with his brother Esau and how his father Isaac played favorites between the two of them. He's just passing on the same generational sin to his children. He's playing favorites. And his children absolutely knew Joseph was the favorite. They hated him for it. And now they know Benjamin's the favorite. But their hearts have changed. You see, a lot of times we read these stories, Joseph or whatever, and we think like, oh, we're Joseph in this story. From this point on, I want you to realize we are far more like these brothers than Joseph. The father's holding Benjamin back because he's his favorite. The 10 brothers go to Egypt and they don't know Joseph is there. They don't know Joseph is alive. They're just going to Egypt. And and, and Joseph was a boy when they threw him into into, into slavery. I mean, this this has been decades. There's a full-grown man in front of them now who's in full Egyptian garb. They do not know it's Joseph. But they just think it's a powerful official in Egypt. And so they show up there, and it goes down to verse 13. Look what it says. Uh, Joseph kind of asks them why you're here. And this is their reply, verse 13. But they replied, your servants, look at this, were 12 brothers, the sons of one man, who lived in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. Here's what I love about this. This this whole series, this whole sermon is about forgiveness and reconciliation. But notice what these brothers did first. They owned what they did. They owned who they were. They could have told the story and painted themselves as a hero. Oh, there's 10 of us, and we came from so far, and we we, we risked peril to come here to get food for our our aging father. That's the way to tell a story as a hero. But they were honest with themselves. We're villains. There were 12 of us. One's back home, and one's no more because of what we did. And you see this this honesty in front of Joseph that that they didn't have to be. But that's, I'm telling you, that's where the the beginning of reconciliation starts, lies, in us owning what we did, saying you're sorry and truly owning what you did. Not sorry you felt that way. Not sorry I offended you. No, I'm sorry I did that. I'm sorry I hurt you. I did not mean to hurt you. I'm sorry. But we got to get better at that. Not not saying like who needs to forgive us. No, no, no. Who do we need to go and ask forgiveness from? I 
harmed you, sinned against you, forgive me. Verse 14, it goes on, it says this, Joseph said to them, it was just as I told you, you are spies. This is great. And this is how you will be tested. If you have my, if I have my Bible open, I might be underlined that line tested or put a little mark by there. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place until your youngest brother comes here. And so he's going to send to get uh, Benjamin here. Here's what I love about this. Joseph is going to test his brothers. They're going to test if his hearts are genuinely changed, if they're genuinely men of forgiveness, of, 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 of repentance, and if he is safe to forgive them. So he's going to, he makes this big elaborate test, and we're going to read about it in just a minute, where he's going to bring Benjamin there. He's going to frame Benjamin for stealing something. He's going to ask them to abandon Benjamin, and we're going to see how they handle that. But, but I say all that to say this. You all need to realize God is giving you tests. I believe that with all my heart. God is giving every single one of us tests. And, and I think it's important that we pass these tests. Now, let's talk about this one second. First off, Everybody seems like, sounds like it's mean. Everybody says it sounds mean that God would test you. Why would God test me? Why doesn't he just trust me? Why would God test me? Why would, he, why, would he, why would you test me? And for some reason in the spiritual world, in our spiritual walk, we don't like to be tested. Don't test my faith, you know? Um, and we don't like to be tested in our spiritual wo- world. But you know what's interesting? We have no problem being tested in any other facet of life. When my daughters come home from school and they're like, oh, we got an algebra test. I'm like, oh, your teachers are cruel. Uh, Dad, I, I read all the driving manual stuff. I got to go take the driving test. No, why do they test you like this? Dad, I, I, I went to jujitsu class. I, 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 did the, I did the test and I got my blue belt. Why must they test you? You see, testing has a purpose. Testing is a good thing. And here's the, here's the beauty of testing. Like the person you were the moment before you took the test and the person you were after that test, you're the same person. All the test did was allow you to know that you could do it. The algebra test gives my daughter the, the assurance, like, I can do algebra. I got this question sheet. I did every answer. I got 80% of them right. That's pretty good. The test helps you believe in yourself and your ability. I think God tests us, not because he, need, we, he needs us to prove something to him. I think he needs you to believe in you. Believe that you could be a man or woman of forgiveness. Believe you could be a man or woman of peace. Believe you could be a man or woman of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. God, put me in some tests. And let's pass them. Let's stop, let's stop getting so worried. Like, let's look at opportunities to pass some tests. Like, let me ask you this. Agape said, what test do you need to pass? What test do you need to pass? Because here's what I believe. I personally believe this. God will keep giving you the same test over and over again until you pass it. He'll just give you the same one over and over again. So it's like, and it, you pick your sin, uh, whatever you want you want. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple, we'll make it awkward, okay? Uh, maybe, maybe you need to pass a test of rage. Maybe you have wrath, you have rage in you, and, and, like, and that's in you. you. You get angry so fast and so easy, all right? Guess what? God's going to give you a test every day. He's going to give you school drop-off. <laughs> and do you hold it together? Do you, or, do you, or, or do you snap and like, ah, you know? Like, like, let's pass that test. Every day when it comes, let's pass to the next one. Let's pass to the next one. I'll give you another one, okay? Again, I'm not trying to pick on anybody. But let's talk about it. In the United States of America, a lot of us want to be a little bit smaller than we currently are. And maybe it's either self-control, maybe it's full-on gluttony, but like some of us, like, we would say our weight is an issue for us. And I'm not judging anyone. We would say that's true of ourselves. So guess what? When you're in between meals and, you, and, and you're thinking about going in for that snack and you know that's not what you need and you know that's not ultimately we're going to lead you where you want to be, like, that's a test. Let's win that one. Let's say, you know what, this time I'm going to win this one. I might not win them all, but I'm going to win this one. I don't know what that is for you. Maybe you're tempted by lust and, and, and you win a test by, you know, uh, uh, you know bouncing your eyes and, and keeping your focus on the Lord. Maybe you're, you're tempted by whatever it is, but we got to win these battles. And forgiveness is a huge one. When you have the opportunity to ask for forgiveness, when you have the opportunity to give forgiveness, this is an opportunity for you to put your faith to work and actually do it. And I'm telling you, when you do it, you realize, oh, I'm capable of doing this. 
I'm capable of acknowledging that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I'm capable of acknowledging that I hurt people sometimes unintentionally and I ask for forgiveness and I've felt people forgive me so I, I, I know it can happen and I don't have to be defensive. I don't have to be insecure. I can, I can just be a man or woman of peace. So many people want to read the Bible day in and day out but they don't want to go do it but it's in the doing it where we pass these tests and we realize we can do it and God is real and he's with us and this way works. And so for his brothers, they're going to go into this time of testing, but it's not cruel. It's, it's this opportunity for them as brothers to realize we're changed men. We're not who we once were. We're not murderers who abandon our brother. And we know that because of what happens next. So it goes on to verse uh, 21. It says this. They said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. Now, again, they're still talking right in front of Joseph. Joseph is dressed like an Egyptian. He's using an interpreter. They don't even know it's him. So they're having a conversation in Hebrew. They don't know that Joseph can, that it's Joseph and he understands Hebrew. They think it's a private conversation. And look what they say. This test, having to go get Benjamin, having to bring him here, oh, this is what we deserve because we are being punished because of what we did to Joseph. We saw Joseph's distress. We saw how he pleaded for his life and we were cold and callous and we threw him in that cistern and sold him into slavery. We would not listen and that's why this is happening to us. Agape City, if nothing else, see how these brothers at least own their sin that is, that is so inspiring to be able just to acknowledge your sin. Acknowledge what you did wrong, how you did it. And then, and then get to a point where you say, I deserve this. Because here's the truth. Every single one of us in the room is a sinner in need of a savior and the wages of sin is death. And every single one of us deserves punishment from God. We deserve death from God. Every single one of us, that's what we deserve. Very few people feel like they deserve it. They feel like they deserve blessings and great parking spots. But we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we deserve punishment. Is that why this is happening to us? Because we're just getting what we deserve, and we're not going to justify it anymore. We're going to own it. I'm the villain. I'm not even the victim. I wish I could, I, at this point, I wish I could even say I'm the victim. I'm not. I'm the villain. And that's why this bad thing is happening to me, because I have not forgiven. And so it goes on in the very next verse, 22. It says this, Reuben said, didn't I tell you not, uh, not to sin against the boy, but you wouldn't listen. And now we must give an account for his blood. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. So what you see is a true and honest contrite heart. You see contrition. The brothers are showing up. They don't even know it's Joseph. They're, just, they're owning what they did. They're owning that they, they threw a brother into slavery. They're owning that this hard time is, is they deserve it. And they're just sitting here with, asking for mercy from a man of power. And so he says, okay, I'll give you mercy, but you gotta bring Benjamin here. Now I gotta skip ahead real fast to chapter 44. And, 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 and so if you have your Bible, you go to chapter 44. But they bring Benjamin there. They have a whole big feast. They, they, they load up these sacks with food and with grain. And they're gonna send them back home to, to Israel with all this food. But Joseph puts one of his, his gold uh, cup in Benjamin's sack. First, chapter 44, verse 1 and 2 says this. Now Joseph gave these instructions to the steward of his house. Fill them in sack with as much food as they can carry and put each man's silver in the mouth of the sack. Then put my cup, the silver one, in the mouth of the youngest set, one sack, along with the silver for his grain. And he did uh, as Joseph said. The brothers leave. They're on their journey home. Joseph sends his steward after them and says, now go accuse them of stealing. And whoever's cup you find, whatever bag you find that cup in, we're going to put that person in slavery. Skip ahead a couple of verses. Verse 13 says, each of them quickly lowered their sacks. So they start going home. The steward goes out, hey, stop, whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. One of you all stole. Let me see what's in your bags. Look what it says. Each of them quickly lowered their sack to the ground and opened it. And then the steward proceeded to search, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin, in Benjamin's sack. 
And look at this next line. At this, they tore their clothes and they all loaded their donkeys and returned to the city. They are heartbroken. It was Benjamin. The brothers are concerned now. It's Benjamin. Go down to verse 16. They're now in front of Joseph again. And look what they say. What can we say to my my Lord? Judah replied. What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. Look at this. We are now the Lord's slaves. We ourselves and the one who was found would have the cup. They're like, take us all into slavery. Don't, don't just take Benjamin. Put us all in slavery. Where he goes, we go. All 11 of us put us in slavery. And then Joseph goes on and he says, far be it from me to do such a thing. Only the one who is found to have the cup, will have to become my slave. The rest of you can go back to your father in peace. Joseph is giving them the opportunity to do again the exact same thing they did to him. You were jealous of me, and you threw me into slavery in the cistern, and you all went home in peace, and you were happy and content if I died. And now you know Benjamin is the new favorite. Are you going to abandon him too? Are you going to throw him into slavery too? Are you the same men who did that to me? He gives them an opportunity to reveal who they are now. And look at what they do. Skip ahead a few verses, verse 30. It says, so now, if the boy is not with us, so now, if the boy is not with us when we go back, you're... To your, servant's fa- to your servant, my father, and if you're my father's whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life sees that the boy isn't there, he will die. Your servants will bring the gray head of your father down to the grave in sorrow. Your servants have guaranteed the boy's safety to my father, he said, and if I do not bring him back uh, to you, I will bear the blame uh, before you, my father, with all of my life. Basically saying, We can't abandon another one of us. We're not the same people. We're not going back to that. We're not doing it again. If Benjamin stays in slavery, we stay in slavery. And then look at verse 45. Then Joseph, chapter 45, verse 1 and 2. Then Joseph could no longer control himself. Before all his attendants, and he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And then look at this next line. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's whole house heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him. Look at this. Because they were terrified, terrified at his presence. This is such a beautiful scene because there's a lot going on here. But, but, But basically... Joseph gives him the ability to do the exact same thing again. It's a test. It's the same thing. Are you going to throw away another one of your father's favorite children because you don't feel as loved by your dad? And they say, hey, we learned that. We're not doing the same thing again. In fact, keep us in slavery with him. We will not abandon another one. And Joseph sees that their contrition is genuine. They see that they're, they're asking for forgiveness is genuine. And so Joseph says, it's me. It's Joseph. I, I, I love you guys. And then look at their response. They were terrified. Why are they terrified? Because they know they're wrong. Joseph has all the hand. They got no hand. They know they're busted. And they know Joseph is powerful. And all they could do is sit before him and go, we're sorry. And this is such a beautiful allegory because this is our relationship with God. We have to realize we're busted. We have to realize we're wrong. We have to realize that we stand in front of a perfect God and he has the goods on us. We have no hand. That's why when Paul was on the road to Damascus, that's why he was terrified when he saw Jesus because Paul had been killing Christians and when he saw Jesus, he knew Jesus had all the authority to kill him. He was terrified. But then he received grace. That's why Proverbs says it's the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. It's because when you're afraid of what God could do to you, that he could smite you, destroy you, he could punish you, and you deserve all of it. Like, that's that's where you get, like, this honor. Like, it's it's, it's not terrified, like, I need to run from God. It's like, I respect you because you are the authority figure here, and you did no wrong. I'm the one that did wrong. That's why we had this. Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer, Father, you know, uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Like, we can only ask God to forgive us if we are willing to forgive other people. 
And if we're not willing to forgive other people, then we should fear the wrath of God on us. At some point, we've got to pass this test. I get it. People hurt us. But you've got to be honest, and we've got to take the hit. We hurt people. We're all sinners. We're, we're, we're devouring each other. And when no one wants to give mercy, then, then where does this go? I hurt you, you hurt me. I hurt you, you hurt me. I hurt you, you hurt me. I cut you out of my life, cut you out of my life. And, then, and we're all just isolated and wounded. Who was going on the battlefield and doing triage? Who was healing people? Who was reconciling people? Who was asking for mercy? Who's owning their stuff? Who is the wise ones here? We need more people who are willing just to say, I'm sorry. I was the villain. I'm not the hero. I'm not also the victim either, but I was the villain, and I'm sorry for what I did. These brothers have this holy moment before Joseph, and, 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 and they're terrified because they have no hand, and they're going to receive whatever Joseph gives them, but this is the beauty. Joseph gives mercy, and please understand this. I use this illustration all the time, but when we were in elementary school, we used to play this game on the, on the playground where you interlock fingers like that, you know, and then like you would like try to break each other's wrists, you know, like, you know, the 80s were a weird time, and uh, and if you played that game, you know, when your wrists were being bent back and they were starting to hurt, what did you say to make it stop? Mercy. But never forget this. It is the winner. It is the strong person who chooses to give mercy. It's not weak to be merciful. It is a powerful position to be. And we need to stop holding grudges. I believe that's weakness. And we need to be men and women who give mercy out of our strength. Joseph models this well. He has mercy for his brothers. It goes on. Uh, verse 4, it says this. Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When he had done, uh, done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one that you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves. Look at this grace Joseph has given them. Don't be angry with yourself for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been a famine in the land and the next five years, there will be no plowing and no reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. I assure you, Joseph did not enjoy being a slave. I assure you, he did not enjoy being in prison. And don't forget, those were decades, about 12, 15 years of his life. Joseph was not having good days but he was holding on to his good character. And God was presenting, putting him in a higher place of authority. And, and God saw him all the way through and God sustained him through that. Agape City, I, no one gets through this life unscathed. Other people's sin hits us. So our sin hits other people. We're all damaged in some way. And none of us are getting through this unscathed. The question is, are we continuing to damage others and ourselves or are we open to the reconciliation that God has? And are we willing to own whatever we need to own? And look at Joseph's mindset here. He said, hey, you, I know what you did was horrible, but I really feel like God has sent me ahead of you to turn around to save you. You see, God's always working. He doesn't waste a hurt. He doesn't waste a trauma. He doesn't waste whatever. Satan is going to try to destroy you. He tries to, he's a thief who tries to steal, kill, and destroy. But God is, brings life and life to the full. I'm telling you, Satan is going to try to just tear you down, but God is redeeming all of it. To where what, Jake, what Satan thinks he did to harm you, all he did was give you a testimony. When I think about what I've been through in my life and childhood and, when, and you know, bad stepdad or whatever, these things I went through, whatever, like, it's like Satan was literally trying to destroy a little child trying to destroy his innocence, trying to destroy his love of God to believe that he could be loved by other people. Satan tried to destroy me. And that low-down, dirty dog failed. And all he did was give me a testimony. He gave me more assurance. And then as I gave grace to uh, my biological father, as I gave grace to my stepfather, as I healed through all of those things, as I forgave those people who harmed me, I got to see how powerful I really am. And I'm telling you, God has that for you too. But we have to stop 
playing the victim or the hero. We've got to realize a lot of times who we are is the villain, and, and it's only by the grace of God that we get through any of this. And that is what got Joseph through this. So Joseph's family is now whole. The nation of Israel is completely saved. Understand, that one moment of forgiveness is the reason we have Jesus. And that's not hyperbolic. Joseph forgives his brother. He brings him to Egypt. He gives them life and sustains them. It's out of Joseph's brother Judah that we get Jesus. It's out of brother Benjamin that we get um, Paul, the apostle Paul. It's out of Levi that we get Moses. Like, like it's from the family line of this family that we get all the great men and women of our faith. They, they came from this lineage. And had Joseph not forgiven them, this story might have ended there. God's will may not have been done. We have a role to play in God's kingdom. He's still writing his story. And when we honor God and forgive God, we are making it available for him to do, have his kingdom and way in this world. Now, i got to get this wrapped up. Uh, skip ahead to verse 50. Verse 50 and verse 15. Chapter 50, verse 15. Because here's what I want you to see. Everything's been going great now for about a decade. Joseph's brothers are there. They went and got his dad. They moved him there. Everybody forgave one another. They're hugging each other. It's kumbaya. They're starting to have their own children. Joseph's having children. Like, it's been years now of them all living in Egypt, all getting along as brothers and sisters, and they're all going, everything's going great until Joseph's dad dies. Just natural death of old age. Jacob dies. And then look what happens to his brothers. Verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and, pr- and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent out word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. And this is the instructions. He said this, this is what you are to say to Joseph. I asked, I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs that they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of your servants of the, of, uh, of the God of your father. And when their message came to him, Joseph wept. <sighs> Y'all, this is what we do. They, Joseph forgave them. They received forgiveness. They've been good. Things have been good for decades now, about 12 years. And then Jacob dies. Notice Joseph has not said anything. He didn't change anything. He didn't do it. Joseph didn't even do anything. Just Jacob dying <sighs> caused the insecurity of the brothers to well up. And then they started having conversations in their head that are not real. But what if, what if, he's, what if, he's, what if this is a long con? What if he's been angry this whole time? He's been waiting for dad to die, and now he's going to kill us. And they're making up a scenario that's not real. Y'all, sins are forgiven. Insecurities tend to linger. Sins are forgiven. Insecurities tend to linger. And, and, and you can believe you're forgiven of a sin, but the problem is an insecurity is you know who you are. And the insecurity comes from you know you have the ability to do that again. I have the ability to fall back into that again. I don't believe in myself. I'm insecure. I have not passed enough tests. I am insecure. And out of our insecurity, then fear comes in. And when fear comes in, it's like, well, Joseph, don't you love me? How many times do I got to say I love you? I said I was loved. No, I forgave you. And so now they're afraid of him. That's why he's weeping. Like, why, why are you still afraid that I'm holding a grudge? Like, And I love Joseph's response. I'll leave you with this verse, verse 19. His response is this. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. I am in the place, uh, am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for the good to accomplish what is now being done in the saving of many lives. And to me, that is the line. That is the line of the entire book of Genesis. You intended to harm me, but God used it for good. Y'all, life happens, and sin pervades, and humans get hurt. Satan loves it. Some people hurt with malicious intent. They intend to make fun of you. They intend to laugh at you. They intend to mock you and make fun of your faith. Some of us have been really wronged by our family. Objectively, they are wrong. I am right. They wronged me. These are all things that happen. But I'm telling you, what that person, what their sin, what Satan himself intended to harm you, I'm telling you, it cannot touch you eternally. 
Joseph rose to the top wherever he was. They tried to harm him wherever he, 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 he couldn't stop it. Because wherever he was, he just focused on God and he honored God and God just saw him through it. You intended to harm me, but God worked it out for its good. And Agape City, I'm just telling you, as a man of God, as a man of faith, as a man who's maybe a little bit further along in my spiritual walk than some of you, I'm just telling you, when you keep passing these tests, these problems start to seem smaller and smaller and smaller. And this world may throw a lot at you to try to harm you. But I just can't wait to see how. How is this one going to work out, God? How is this going to work out? How is this going to work out? And, and it's scary. It's scary when you're going through it, but I have that hope. I have that faith. That's what faith is. I have faith. This is going to work out. So Agape City, at some point, we got to stop asking why. Why is this happening to me? Why is life so hard? Why, why is you know, everybody love me like I wanted to be loved? Why isn't everything perfect? We got to stop asking why. And we need to have minds and hearts to say how. How, God, are you going to redeem this? How, God, are you going to work this through? How, God, are you going to, you know, make this right? I know you're a good God. I know you're a good. How, God, are you going to bring good to this? And I'm telling you, faith, like just that amount of faith of a mustard seed, that may be the strength you need to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So, God, City, this is my challenge for you. It's first and foremost, in this area of forgiveness, are you a hero? Are you a victim? Or has there been seasons of your life where you've been a villain? And we got to realize, man, someone has to be the strong one. Someone has to be the mature one. Someone has to have the love in their heart to break the cycle. And if it's not the children of God, I don't know who it's going to be in this world. So what would it look like for you, for me, for us to look at Joseph's life as an example forgive when people ask for it genuinely to look at Joseph's brothers and, and say hey maybe we need to ask for forgiveness genuinely and maybe for all of us we need to realize what echoes out of that might be the very fertile ground that the kingdom of God grows out of this is real this is not bible study this is, this is transformational stuff that will free you from hatred and rage and insecurity and it will transform who you are to the point where you believe you are the son of a living God. You are the daughter of a living God. And I'm telling you, when you believe that, the world sees it. And that is when, I'm telling you, the kingdom goes with you. So, Agape, we're going to enter a time right now of response. This is a time that we leave you time and space in the service to respond to God. And the first response I have to offer is this. If you're here today, and maybe for the first time, you're feeling convicted, God, I am the villain. I'm the one who sinned against you. I deserve every bad thing that comes my way. My sin put you on the cross, Jesus. And I'm sorry for that. If today you want to repent... If you want to accept the love of Jesus, and if today you want to make him your savior and be baptized into Christ, then we have leaders over here with lanyards on who would love to pray with you, and they'd love to talk about what it means to, to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I'll say this too. I, I know in a room this size, and there's so many of us who have family issues and, and past traumas, and if there's anything that you just need strength, you need someone just to lift you up in prayers for some strength, this prayer team would love to pray over you. You're welcome to go over there at any point during this next song and just say, would you pray over me? Would you help me? Because I'm going to have a tough conversation this week and I don't know if I have the strength myself. Then I'll say this. Uh, we give everybody the, the elements of communion. First off, this is probably only appropriate to take if you are a believer in Jesus. So if you don't believe in Jesus, you probably shouldn't take this at all. In fact, you should not take this. Um, but also, even if you are a believer, in Matthew chapter 5, it's like verse 23 or so. Jesus himself says, hey, if, if you need to ask for forgiveness from a brother, don't take this until you do that. So Agape City, if we need to be men and women who are maybe realize we're the villain in something, here's what I want to challenge you to do. Could you be honest with yourself enough to not take communion today? And maybe if you like snapped at your kid or maybe if you've been like, you, you have a fallen out with a spouse, maybe you haven't like, you, you, you know your story. Like, 
if there's something like, hey, you know what? When I think about that scenario, honestly, I'm kind of the bad guy here. And maybe I need to ask for forgiveness. Then I want to invite you, don't take communion today. I want to invite you just to take this cup home with you. Place it on your, uh, on your, your vanity at home. Put it, put it by where you put your keys, where you go out the house or whatever. And just have that cup sitting there. And when you wait until you have that conversation, and when you have that conversation and you pass that test, and here's the thing, they may or may not forgive you. Just because you ask for forgiveness doesn't mean everybody's going to forgive you. But it's worth the ask. And after you make that, then, then you take this communion. And many of us right now, you're ready to take it now. So however you need to respond to that, we're going to ask you to respond to that. But, but here's where the challenge is. All of this is about realizing the foundation of our life is Christ himself. And Jesus says to love your enemy, to love your neighbor, to be men and women of peace. So this week, how do we live that out for God's glory? I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to worship, and I'll let you have some space to respond. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I come before you, and Father God, that's my prayer. For each and every soul in this room, God, I pray that, that we would not see tests as a burden. We would see them as an opportunity, an opportunity to become stronger, the opportunity to believe in ourselves, not just that you exist, but that you are strengthening us and you're growing us and you're discipling us and you're preparing us for good works. God, I pray for men and women to mature. Not just show up out of a routine, to progress in the maturation of their knowledge of your truth, to progress in their boldness to apply that knowledge and to progress, God, in their willingness to die to themselves, to live for you so that your kingdom can shine through us, God. That is my prayer. And Father, I pray that be the prayer of every soul in this room. But God, I know that starts in a very sensitive place of us acknowledging our sin and how we have harmed others. So Holy Spirit, would you whisper into the hearts in this room today? Convict those who need conviction. Comfort those who need comforting. Counsel all of us with the wisdom of what to do. And God, would you help us to forgive others the same way you forgave us. And by doing so, may your kingdom come in our relationships. Father, that is my prayer, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Whenever you're ready, you can respond.